This is the VOA Special English Development Report. More than three billion people are at risk from indoor air pollution because of the heating or cooking fuels they use. Most live in Africa, India, and China. They use biomass fuels like wood, crop waste, animal waste, or coal. These solid fuels may be the least costly fuels available, but they are also a major cause of health problems and death. For more than 30 years, the Aprovecho Research Center has been designing cleaner, low-cost cooking stoves for the developing world. Dean Still is the director of the group, which is based in the United States. He notes a World Health Organization estimate that more than one and a half million people a year die from breathing smoke from solid fuels. Mr. Still says, and half of the people on planet Earth every day use wood or biomass for cooking. These are the people on Earth who have less money, and the richer people use oil and gas. It's been estimated that wood is running out more quickly than oil and gas, and so it is very important for the poorer people to have very efficient stoves that protect their forests and that protect their health. Every year, Aprovecho holds a stove camp at its testing station in Cottage Grove, Oregon. Engineers, inventors, students, and others come together to design and test different methods and materials for improving stoves. Over the years, the group has made stoves using mud, bricks, sheet metal, clay, ceramics, and old oil drums. Most of the stoves look like large, deep cooking pots. They have an opening at the bottom for the fire and a place on top to put a pot. Through the years, Dean Still says his group has experimented with countless stove designs. He says the goal is to make a very inexpensive stove that costs about $5. It would make very little smoke, so it would be safe for health and reduce global warming and deforestation. Aprovecho has now partnered with a stove manufacturer in China. The company is making Aprovecho's first mass-produced stoves. They are said to use 40 to 50 percent less wood than an open fire and produce 50 to 75 percent less smoke. A company called Stove Tech is selling them through its website for less than ten dollars. Dean Still says that more than 100,000 have been sold so far. And that's the VOA Special English Development Report. From VOA Learning English, this is the Health Report. The United Nations Children's Fund is praising Ethiopia for reaching one of the Millennium Development Goals. UNICEF officials say Ethiopia has reduced child deaths by more than two-thirds. Between 1990 and 2012, Ethiopia reported a 67 percent drop in the number of children dying before the age of five. Ethiopia's Minister of Health, Kesa Tibiran Admasu, says the country has committed to end all preventable child deaths in a generation by 2035. Diarrhea, pneumonia, and malaria 
are the leading causes of death among children in Ethiopia. In 1990, the country's death rate for children under five was one of the highest in the world. The death rate has dropped from 204 deaths for every 1,000 births to 68 deaths per 1,000 births. Hundreds of thousands of Ethiopian children who might have died in earlier years now reach their fifth birthday. Ethiopia is one of four African countries to have reached a Millennium Development Goal. The other three are Liberia, Malawi, and Tanzania. One reason for Ethiopia's success is its health extension program. The program employed 38,000 people to bring health care services to a large part of the rural population. Peter Salama is UNICEF's representative for Ethiopia. He says Ethiopia's plan can serve as an example. He says delegations from Togo, Guinea, and Namibia have come to study the health extension program. The United Nations approved the Millennium Development Goals in 2001. The goals were meant to get countries to pay more attention to issues such as fighting extreme poverty. Progress on the goal of reducing child deaths is slow in most countries. Only 13 of 61 countries are in a position to meet it. For VOA Learning English, I'm Carolyn Prasuti. From VOA Learning English, this is the Education Report. Kid Pan Alley is a nonprofit organization that holds songwriting workshops for students across the United States. The organization recently visited a school in the Anacostia area of Washington, D.C. The children presented a concert with the help of songwriter and recording artist Paul Reisler. He established Kid Pan Alley in 1999 and has worked with more than 35,000 students and produced more than 2,200 songs since that time. He says the power of music can teach children skills they might not learn in school. He believes the American educational system is focused too much on standardized tests to measure success. But Paul Reisler says we now live in a creative economy. He says his group is trying to inspire children to be creative. At Orr Elementary School in Anacostia, 95% of students come from poor families. Marlon Ray is the school's Dean of Students. He says some of the children have difficult lives. But, he says, these kids still want to strive for greatness. Jonna Turner is director of programs at the school. She says the fourth and fifth grade students are often focused on more than school. They can be important helpers for their families. They make sure food is ready when they come home and do other tasks. Yet, Students are often influenced by what happens around them. A shooting took place in April directly in front of the school. Although no one was injured, the event affected the whole community. 
Still, Orr Elementary School has a positive, hopeful atmosphere. Marlon Ray says the workshop and concert made possible by Kid Pan Alley created good memories that will last four years. For VOA Learning English, I'm Laurel Bowman. From VOA Learning English, this is the Technology Report. An insect with an extremely unusual ability to hear is the model for what may be the future of hearing aids. The insect, a fly, behaves like a parasite, an organism that lives on or in another organism called a host. This exceptional fly places larva, a young fly, onto a cricket host. The larva digs into the cricket and eats the insect from the inside out. The yellow fly is native to Central America and the southern United States. It finds its larva host by listening for the cricket's sound. The fly's strong sense of hearing can direct it to a cricket even 100 meters away. But the insect's ears are just two millimeters apart. That is so close that sound should reach each ear at almost the same moment. This would make it difficult to find where a sound came from. But the fly also has a tiny structure between its ears that creates pressure to slow down the sound waves. This permits the fly to identify where the sound came from. Neil Hall is a sound engineer at the University of Texas. He and his team of researchers created an electronic hearing device. The team made a silicon copy of the fly's ear structures. They used materials that can turn mechanical pressure into electricity. The device requires little power as a result. This means it would be less costly to use. Mr. Hall says, the device could improve hearing aids in the future. He says it also could have military and defense uses. But, he says, more research and development work is required. In July, the journal Applied Physics Letters published a report about the University of Texas research. For VOA Learning English, I'm Carla Babb. From VOA Learning English, this is the Education Report. Kid Pan Alley is a nonprofit organization that holds songwriting workshops for students across the United States. The organization recently visited a school in the Anacostia area of Washington. The children presented a concert with the help of songwriter and recording artist Paul Reisler. He established Kid Pan Alley in 1999. Since then, he has worked with more than 35,000 students and produced more than 2,200 songs. He says the power of music can teach children skills they might not learn in school. He believes the American educational system is focused too much on standardized tests 
designed to measure knowledge. But Paul Reisler says we now live in a creative economy. He says his group is trying to inspire children to be creative. At Orr Elementary School in Anacostia, 95% of students come from poor families. Marlon Ray is the school's dean of students. He says some of the children have difficult lives. But, he says, these kids still want to strive for greatness. Jonna Turner is director of programs at the school. She says the fourth and fifth grade students are often focused on more than school. Some have to help their families or live in homeless shelters. A shooting took place in April directly in front of the school. No one was injured, but the incident affected the whole community. Students are often influenced by what happens around them. Still, Orr Elementary School has a positive, hopeful atmosphere. Marlon Ray says the workshop and concert made possible by Kid Pan Alley created good memories that will last four years. For VOA Learning English, I'm Laurel Bowman. From VOA Learning English, this is the Science Report. A new group of human remains has been discovered on the plain of jars in Laos. The remains are believed to be about 2,500 years old. The plain of jars is in the central Lao province of Xi'an Quang. The area covers hundreds of kilometers on which there are thousands of ancient stone jars. They are grouped together at about 100 sites. The plain of jars has been a mystery to archeologists or scientists who study prehistoric cultures. A joint research team from Australia and Laos found the remains. Dogold O'Reilly teaches archaeology at Australian National University. He led the fieldwork in Laos. He says some of the jars weigh up to 10 metric tons. Some have been moved 8 to 10 kilometers and were set in groups, he says. Little is known about the people who made the jars or their purpose. The latest field work uncovered an ancient burial ground in an area known as Site 1 in Xi'an Quang province. It has more than 300 jars, thin round stones, and markers. The scientists say the ancient people had different ways of burying the dead. They include burials of whole bodies and burials of containers of bones. Scientists will test the remains. They may provide information on the culture of the people linked to the sites. O'Reilly said, it is possible that the Lao sites may be linked to similar jar sites in India. The effort may soon provide answers to one of Southeast Asia's greatest cultural mysteries. For VOA Learning English, I'm 
Nikki Strong. From VOA Learning English, this is the Technology Report. One of the most important resources the United States has to offer may be its highly educated immigrants. A new study by the Information Technology and Innovation Foundation, or ITIF, finds 35% of those who invent products or discover new ideas in the U.S. were born in other countries. The group looked at inventors who have won national awards. They also looked at people who applied for international legal protection or patents for their ideas and in information technology or science. And the group spoke with inventors who work for large technology companies. The ITIF study shows that most inventors have a doctorate or PhD in science, technology, engineering, or mathematics. Adams Nager is an economic expert at the foundation. He says many immigrant inventors come to the United States for research and business possibilities that might not be available in their home countries. He says the study shows the value of bringing the smartest engineers from around the world to the U.S. They bring benefits to the economy with their new ideas and new ways of thinking about things, Nager says. The other two-thirds of American innovators are mostly white men. They are not young. The study found their average age is 47. Almost all of them have at least one advanced educational degree, like a master's or a PhD. The research also finds that women make up only 12% of inventors in the United States. For VOA Learning English, I'm Lucia Malonig. From VOA Learning English, this is the Agriculture Report in Special English. Africa's Sahel area is dry and farming there is difficult. But in Burkina Faso, women could be important in improving agriculture. The United Nations Children's Fund, or UNICEF, and its partners are working to support food production in the West African country. In northern Burkina Faso, farmers till rocky land. Severe droughts are common and floods are taking place more often. Millions of people in Africa's Sahel area are at risk of food insecurity. The United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization says that includes 2.8 million people from Burkina Faso. High food prices, poverty, and displacement have been the result of drought throughout the area. Also, conflict in Mali by Muslim extremists has caused an estimated 65,000 Malian refugees to enter Burkina Faso. A new project run by UNICEF and its partners aims to help communities improve on nutrition and food security. A group of women in northern Burkina Faso 
are now working towards turning dry land into sustainable vegetable and fruit farms. What they do not use for food, they can sell, providing much needed income. The women are trained in farming methods and given money to build wells. They are also taught to farm in ways that conserve water. Through crop selection and rotation, their fields remain productive all year round. The project is expected to last four years and reach almost 1,500 villages across Burkina Faso, which has little infrastructure or industry. Many of the women farmers are taught about the nutritional value of the produce they sell, and they are then encouraged to share this information with their customers. For VOA Learning English, I'm Carolyn Prasuti. This is the VOA Special English Technology Report. America's video game industry was the winner in a decision by the United States Supreme Court. In late June, the justices rejected a law in California that banned the sale or rental of violent video games to people under 18. They said the 2005 law violated the free speech guarantee in the First Amendment to the Constitution. The vote was seven to two. The court decided that video games are a protected form of creative expression, like books, plays, and movies. Paul McGrail, dean of the University of Dayton Law School in Ohio, says California did not see gaming that way. The state of California tried to argue that this was not speech. It was more of an activity because children interact and play with the video games. And so it's not traditional speech like a book or like a magazine. California lawmakers argued that violent games are especially harmful to children. But the court said they were no more harmful than the violence in other forms of media. Justice Antonin Scalia wrote the majority opinion. He pointed to the violence in fairy tales like Snow White and Cinderella and in cartoons. Professor McGrail says the court sees its job as only to decide what is and is not legally protected speech. We don't want to get the Supreme Court into making fine distinctions about what is better than others, because that will lead us down a slippery slope. Once you start deciding that, what's to stop the government from saying that, for example, Grimm's fairy tales themselves are too violent, or that particular books should be banned. In fact, from 1915 to 1952, the Supreme Court permitted censorship of movies for fear they could be used for evil. Today, the film and music industries have voluntary rating systems, and so does the video game industry. For example, extremely violent games are rated M for mature. These are meant for ages 17 and older. Only 5% of the more than 1,600 games rated last year were rated M. Still, Abby Holleran, a manager at a GameStop store in Maryland says M-rated games like Call of Duty, Halo, and Fallout are the most popular games in the store. She says parents have to give their permission for children to buy M-rated games. 
But the majority of the time, when we tell them what's in it, they don't. For VOA Special English, I'm Mario Ritter.